ألا شك بأن الله أعطى تفضلا وأن الذي أعطاه أعطوك مسجلا إن حديث الذوق فيه بشارة للرائين لمن للذائقين توسلا أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد أشرف المرسلين وعلى صحبه أجمعين ومن اتبعه لسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فأقول لكم يا أيها الإخوة والأخوات السلام عليكم brothers and sisters I greet you with the greeting of Islam which is to say may the blessings and the peace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon you after that inshallah uh, we say رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to invoke his blessings and his peace upon his messenger Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib al-Hashimi al-Qurashi al-Arabi al-Ismaili and upon his companions and upon his family and upon all those who seek assistance through his righteous guidance until the day of judgment. Amma ba'd, now as to what proceeds, alhamdulillah, we continue with our second iteration of the Sharh al-Warqat fi usul al-fiqh, the papers, uh, I mean the notes on usul al-fiqh with respect to the subject of usul al-fiqh that was, uh, this is al-Warqat, excuse me, I'm not sure if I said Sharh al-Warqat, this is not a Sharh of al-Warqat, the Sharh of Al-Warqat is Imam Mahali's explication of Al-Warqat itself. This is simply Al-Warqat, Matun Al-Warqat. You understand the text of Al-Warqat. And the first section, we uh, begin with, with the Mabadi, the, the foundations of Usul Al-Fiqh, uh, what its definition is, what its name is, the founder. We mentioned that the founder, for example, uh, is Imam Shafi'i. Uh, we mentioned the benefit that comes out of uh, of out of usul usul fiqh. We mention its its nisba, its relationship with the other sciences, and that it has particularly uh, three sci- three three uh, ancillary sciences that it relies upon. And then we came into the text of al waraqat itself, and he told us uh, he told us what uh, what the what the what the meaning of usul al fiqh is. You understand? He told us what the meaning of usul fiqh is. What the meaning of usul is? Meaning, an usul is the jamul asl. Asl linguistically just means something that something else is founded upon, right? And then fiqh, the word fiqh, it just means linguistically. Uh, it means uh, it means understanding. You understand? Uh, but it's it's knowledge specifically of the rulings of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Fiqh fiqh is more is more specific than ilm. You understand? A person can be a faqih but not an alim because an alim is more comprehensive. Fiqh, understanding and specifically understanding of the rulings of the sharia, uh, it has to do with, uh, has to do, it's, it's, it's very specific, right? And more so, uh, it's fiqh relates to those things that are known, uh, especially when it comes to usul, that are known through ijtihad, that are known through independent legal reasoning, ijtihad, linguistically once again meaning to strive for something. Right, but on a practical level, even the things that are known uh, by the ruri, that are known by necessity, for example, to know that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is one, to know that you have to pray five times a day, is still part of fiqh, because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has uh, mentioned those things in the Quran. The Messenger of Allah has mentioned those things in his Sunnah, and you'll see that any book of fiqh that you will see in any madhab, it will still bring things that are known by necessity because the person still needs to understand it. But the reason why they make this distinction is so you can understand that this process of usul is more so geared towards deriving uh, rulings in a place where you won't necessarily go to the text and know right away this is the ruling of this thing. You understand that it's told to you through, it's not told to you through azam, uh, through a particularly uh, emphasized uh, approach. Allah today he tells us, uh, he gets into the section that's called Anwa'ul Hukum. Anwa'ul Hukum. The categories or the types of rulings. Uh, the person, the, it's more, it's it's better to say types of rulings. You know, so although you can say categories because they fall into categories. If you want to say categories, you would say Aqsamul Hukum. The, the, the categories of rulings. In reality, there's two types of rulings. There's multiple types of rulings, but there's two types of rulings that are related to uh, usul and fiqh. Is the al hukm al and al hukm al Here, he's going to tell us about al hukm al You understand? Those things that the Sharia, the category is related to uh, performance or non-performance, acceptability or non-acceptability, 
with respect to a particular person. You understand? That it's, an, it's those things that relate to the status of a particular action that the, st- that the Sharia has made, uh, has put upon a person or a group of people. Because sometimes the taklif can be towards a community, like the, uh, the fara'id al kifayat, the collective obligations. You understand? So he tells us the categories of rulings. He says, Wal ahkamu sab'ata. Wal ahkamu, wal ahkamu uh, sab'a. There's uh, sab'atun, excuse me. Wal ahkamu sab'atun. That the rulings, when you hear the rulings, the taklifiyah, uh, and the taklifiyah and the wadi'iyah, they're both subsets of the hukm al You understand? Of the legal rulings, as opposed to the hukm al adiyah, the uh, rulings by virtue of uh, of experimentation and observation, hukm al aqliyah, rulings that re- re- that relate to uh, the intellectual patterns, right? Rational, rational deduction, uh, and not hukm al ishissiyah as well, because those are rulings that relate to the senses, right? This is the hukm al which breaks down to the hukm al taklifiyah. And this book doesn't deal with the wadiyah whatsoever, but the taklifia itself also is divided into seven. So generally, when they say anwa al hukm fi sharia, they're talking about the hukm al taklifia. You know so you say wal ahkamu. These rulings are seven. Sabatun. There are seven. Al wajibu. The wajib is the the obligatory. Some call it the fard. Some, such as Imam Abu Hanifa, they make a distinction between the fard and the wajib. Al mandub, the mandub is the recommended. You'll see within the mandub, there's, and we said that when we were talking about, I believe, uh, I, forgot, I, think, I forgot what book it was that we were talking about the other day. It might have been the Mukhtar al Hadith al but we said the mandubat is the widest door. Because within the mandubat, you have the mustahab, you have the, the rawaghib, you have the, you have the, you have istihsan, you have the tawwu, you have adab, and you have, you know, you have sunnah al mu'akkada. You have a different, different levels of, Emphasize emphasis and categorizations within the mandubat, but generally speaking, the mandubat just means the recommended. Well, mubah, you have the 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 permissible, that which is merely permissible. You have the mahadur, you have that which is haram, that which is prohibited. You know, so he calls it al mahadur, that which is forbidden and 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 prohibited. Well, makruh, you have that which is uh, you have that which is disliked, that which carries the ruling of kiraha. And then you have the sahih, and then you have the batil. You have the sound, and you have the batil. The latter two are, excuse me, I said earlier that this book doesn't do doesn't deal with hukmul uh, wad yet. That's incorrect. Five of these are hukmul hukmul taklifia, right? These others are hukmul wad These are the hukmul ahkamul wad are basically the signs that are laid down, the rulings that are laid down, that carry a sign with respect to an action and in respect to its performer. You understand? It's not about the action being wajib or the action being recommended, but rather it's about the state of the action. For example, an action to, um, our actions that relate to the actions that are in the five categories. So you have, for example, a shart, a condition. You have, for example, uh, a rukhsa, a concession. You have, for example, a sabab, a means. Likewise, you have the sahih and you have the batil, the sound or that which is uh, that which is not sound. So he gets into the explication of each of these two things. He says, فَالْوَاجِبُ He says, the obligatory, he says, مَا يُثَابُ عَلَىٰ فِعْلِهِ وَيُعَاقِبُ عَلَىٰ تَرْكِهِ He says that the wajib is that which a person is rewarded for performing it and the person is punished for leaving it. What is more correct that he should have put here is الْوَاجِبُ That the wajib, مَا يُثَابُ عَلَىٰ فِعْلِهِ Is that which a person is rewarded for doing it because of the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا إِسْتَحَقَّ أَنْ يُعَاقَبَ And that which it is, uh, it is uh, deserving that he be punished ala tarkihi for leaving it. The reason for this distinction is because if you leave this statement as it is, the sects such as the Mu'tazila, they believe that if a person, if a person commits a sin, that it's incumbent on Allah, it's obligatory upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to punish you. Whereas the correct aqidah of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that actions are not wajib upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he wills, he can he can uh, he can leave someone that does a bad deed and not punish them. You understand? But the reason why we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he'll we don't say istahaqaba an yuthaqib an yuthab is because 
nothing is incumbent upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not incumbent upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, reward you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is rewarding you is that it is out of his mercy. You understand? But likewise, we we, we should say, that it is incumbent that he be punished because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put the threat there and the possibility is earned by virtue of the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You understand? Because if we don't make that clarification and that explanation, we would think that if a person makes a, does a haram action, then automatically, without any exception, without any doubt, that it becomes incumbent for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to punish you, and that he has to punish you, and he has no choice but to punish you. And this is the i'tiqad, this is the creed of the Mu'tazila, and it's incorrect. You understand? The wajib is, um, the wajib, he explains it pretty well, well to you. Linguistically, that something is wajib, it means that it is it has fallen down, or it has settled. The proof of that, you can see that in the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Hajj about the sacrificial animals, he says, فَإِذَا وَجَبَ جُنُوبُهَا so, uh, when, it, when the sides of the animals have laid down, meaning when you've brought them down, uh, then eat from it. You understand? So, al wajib fil lugha, the wajib with respect to the linguistic sense, uh, it means, uh, uh, it means, al lazim wa thabit, is that something comes and settles down. You understand? Uh, so it means something coming down and settling down. So it's as though the command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about this is firmly settled down. Then he says to you, وَالْمَنْدُوبُ مَا يُثَابُ عَلَىٰ فِعْلِهِ وَلَا يُعَاقِبُ عَلَىٰ تَرْكِهِ That the recommended action is that which a person is rewarded for performing it, and uh, and and but he's not punished for leaving it, right? So this gives you a very good understanding of where actions fall in the Sharia. And how you know that a person is rewarded or punished for this action is you have to look into the sacred text uh, of the Quran. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Maryam uh, that those that left the prayer, you know, or he mentions in Surah al I believe in Surah al uh, it's in Juz Amma, I forget the Surah. But when they ask the people, what landed you in Saqqara, in, uh, in the hellfire? Their response is that we weren't amongst the Musalleen, we were, among, we were not amongst those who prayed. Likewise, in Surah Al-Maryam, Allah SWT, after discussing the affair of the Prophets, He says that what happened was that there came a generation after them that wasted the prayer. So they would they, they met ghay, they met destruction. You understand? Likewise, we see the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi making countless uh, hadith that talk about the, the, the person that leaves the Salah, right? You understand? And the, the rewards thereby as well. But you've never heard a punishment for someone that leaves off witr. You've never heard the Prophet ﷺ saying that if someone leaves off the, 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 the Eid prayer, for example, that he's going to be punished with such and such a prayer. If somebody leaves off giving obligatory sadaqah, oh, uh, excuse me, sadaqah, he's going to be punished with such and such. So that indicates that those actions are mandubat. But you will hear that the Prophet ﷺ, he says that this action, you're rewarded for it if you do it. You understand? So that's an indication that that action is something that's mandub. You understand? He says next, he says, wal mubah. Well, Mubah, he says, is ma la yuthaqib ala fi'lihi wa la yuaqib ala tarkihi. That the Mubah is that which a person is not, is, is not punished for uh, if, he, if he does it. Excuse me, is not rewarded for if he does it. Wa la yuaqib ala tarkihi. And I, and I forgot to say that the mandub linguistically, uh, it, means, uh, it's, it means a call towards something. Al mandubu fil lugha hiya. Uh, huwa ismul, ismul maf'ul. It's an ismul maf'ul. It's a, uh, uh, an, obj- an, an object noun. It's an object noun. It's something that's acted upon. Min al and it comes from the, the root word nadab. And it and is wahua, I should say wahua, not wahia. Wahua dua, and it's a call il al fi'li, towards an action. So mandub linguistically means that you're being called to something. Whereas wajib linguistically means something that has settled down and fallen down and become established on the ground. You understand? Now, so then he, he goes into the mubah. He says that the mubah is that which, uh, uh, he says the mubah is that which uh, you're not rewarded for doing it. No, are you punished for, for, for leaving it? You understand? But if you perform the mubah for the purpose of uh, some type of act of obedience or taqarrub, uh, getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you will be rewarded for it. You know what I'm saying? You will be rewarded for it. For example, if a person eats healthy food so they can have strength to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Sharia didn't say that you have to that, that you have to eat a certain type of food, but he makes this, this choice 
because I want to be strong. So when I worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, I have uh, a lot of strength to, 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 to do so. In that case, that person will be rewarded for that action that is mubah. Sometimes a mubah action can go, can be haram for a person. You understand? Uh, because it would fall into a different ruling. There would be a karina, there would be a text that comes that would clarify why it's haram. A simple example, there's nothing in the sharia that prohibits a person from eating sugar. There's nothing absolutely in the sharia that prohibits a person from eating sugar. But if a person comes and then he has the, he has the worst type 1 or type 2 diabetes, if he eats sugar, he knows that if he eats too much sugar, he'll die. And then that person starts to eat every day. It's a cake. You, and you know that it, this person it eats cake and, 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 and he'll die, right? You know that. And you start to give him cake every single day. What are you doing? You're being a symbol for this person killing himself. Killing yourself is haram, and helping someone to kill themselves is also haram. You understand? And if the sabab leads directly towards that outcome, the asbab towards the haram also has the ruling of it being haram. So here we have an example of something that's mubah, going from, uh, going from the status of being mubah, of just being merely permissible, towards being uh, completely haram. You understand? Towards being completely haram. Mm -hmm. He says, well, mahdhur, uh, uh, the mahdhur, it just means in, in, in lugha, mahdhur means al mamnu'a, something that's prevented from occurring, I mean, something that's prohibited, right? Something that should not occur. Some, some, there's different names for the, uh, for the mahdhur. Uh, you have, for example, uh, uh, muharram, that is haram, ma'asiya, that is disobedient. You have dhamb, that it is uh, sinful, you know? But the general word that we use in everyday parlance is haram. You understand? That is, it's, it's, it's haram. Something is haram. But they all carry that uh, that import. So the mahdhur or the haram, he says, ma yuthaq, ma yuthaq, excuse me, ma yuthaqibu ala tarkihi wa yuaqibu ala fi'lihi. Is that which a person is rewarded for leaving it off? Wa, 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 once again, we add the caveat here. Wa, wa istahaqqa an yuaqiba ala fi'lihi. And it is... He, it, it's deserving, it's fitting, and it's appropriate that that person be punished if he performs it. Walakin, you won't say, وَمَا إِسْتَوْجَبَ أَنْ يُعَاقِبَ عَلَىٰ فِعْلِهِ It doesn't mean that it's wajib that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes a person that murders or punishes a person that is, you know, uh, drinking alcohol or punishes a person that is fornicating. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's threat. So him carrying out his threat, he'll do that. But making something that's incumbent upon him is, is as though you're ascribing a naqas, uh, 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 a deficiency to the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know in aqeedah that nothing is wajib upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Fatir, if he wills, he can destroy you and replace you with new people. وَمَا ذَلِكَ اللَّهِ بِعَزِيزِ That's not difficult for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all, right? But so likewise, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that something is mahdhur, it means that if you if you leave it, that you're rewarded for it. But leaving it is not ala 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 al ajaz. It's not because of being having incapacity to perform that action. You understand? An old man he wants to fornicate like nobody's business, but he has erectile dysfunction. I, <laughs> a person wants to kill someone, but he's gun jams. Right? Uh, a person wants to take uh, uh, he wants to give people usury, but he has no capital to do so. A person wants to drink alcohol, goes to, you know, he goes to, uh, what's the store? I think it's called a beer store or uh, what's the, like, LCBO. He goes to LCBO. Ah, for, it, LCBO is, is shut down because of the National Truth and Reconciliation Day. That person, he's not rewarded as we see in the hadith that comes uh, by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, of the person that aims for a sin and doesn't do it. The person that aims for a sin and doesn't do it is the person that he has the hum to do it, but the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the knowledge that this is haram, that's what keeps him from doing it. But the person that's not able to do it, but yet he wants to do it, he'll have an ism, he'll have a sin. Indeed, the, the actions are by their intentions. You understand? But likewise, it's that which it is appropriate for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to punish you if you do it. You understand? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, out, has outlined specific hudud, specific uh, limits. And he has said that whoever transgresses these limits, you have this particular punishment. You understand? He's... He says, well, makruh, the disliked, uh, makruh, uh, uh, lughatan, and, 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 and uh, just like linguistically, diddul mahboob. It's just the opposite of something that's, that's desirable. Al mahboob is something that people love. 
right? So the makruh is just the opposite of that. Some things, the ta'rif, the definition is only known if you give its opposite. So makruh is just the opposite of mahboob. And the sharia is that which ma yutha, ma, ma yuthabu ala tarkihi. Is that which you're rewarded for leaving it? Wala yu'aqibu ala fi'alihi. But you're not, you're not rewarded for, you're not rewarded, for, you're not, excuse me, you're not punished for doing it, right? For example, a person eats with his left hand. It's makruh. The Prophet ﷺ said that the shaitan eats with his left hand. But I can't, the Prophet ﷺ never outlined a specific punishment for the eating with your left hand in sharia, but it's clearly disliked. If you leave it because you're doing iqtida, you're doing following the Prophet ﷺ sunnah, then you're rewarded for it. If you do it, you're not punished, but it's disliked. You understand? He says, was sahih. He says, was sahih, the accepted, the valid, excuse me, the sound, I should say. مَا يَتَعَلَّقُ بِهِ النُّفُوذ وَيَعَتَّدُ بِهِ He says, it's that which has nufuz attached to it. And nufuz means validity and acceptability when it comes to contracts and muamalat and actions and transactions between people. Right? So, for example, I buy, somebody comes to me with 10 grams of dates. I have 10 grams of a different dates. I, he gives it to me. He gives it to, I give it to him. There's no food. It's accepted. The contract is sahih in the sharia. Somebody comes to me for an acceptable, non-inflated plot price of rice. I have rice. I give him the rice. He gives me the money. That that transaction, ta'allaku bihi an And when it comes to actions of ibadat, actions of worship, ma yata'allaku bihi, ma yata'allaku bihi al i'tidad. He doesn't say it in this word. He says, Is that which is counted? Is that which the Sharia says? Okay, it's time for Salatul Fajr. Six o'clock has come as the time for Salatul Fajr. You've covered your aura. You're a Muslim. You meet all the shurut. You, you, you've done all the shurut. You pray. You've done it. You've prayed it in all the conditions of met of the prayer. Your salah is, has i'tidad. It has, it counts. It's, it's sahiyah. Right? He says, He says, in the, in the, in the unsound, you understand? Know the unsound, he says, مَا لَا يَتَعَلَّقُ بِهِ النُّفُوذ وَلَا يَعْتَدِ بِهِ Is that which doesn't have nufuth validity attached to it? وَلَا يَعْتَدِ بِهِ Nor is it counted. You understand? Uh, 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 the Imam Abu Hanifa, he distinguishes between uh, batil and fasad. He says, batil is that which the Sharia never allowed in the first place. Right? So, for example, if you were to try to sell pigs, right? If you were to try to sell pigs, Imam Abu Hanifa says that that action is batil because the Sharia never allows you to sell pigs in the first place. You know that? But if you were to try to sell ch- 10 chickens for, for, for 15 chickens, that's said, according to Imam Abu Hanifa, that is something that is fasted, it's corrupt. Because you're allowed to ch- exchange chickens for chickens, but you're not allowed to exchange them at an unequal price, as the Prophet's hadith indicates. Inshallah, we'll end it here. Jazakumullah khair, ikhwan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq and barakah. Wa ma'a thalika Allahi bi aziz. Inna thalika Allahi yasir. Subhanahu bika bin al-azidah ma yasifun. Wa salamu ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa nahnu ra'aynahu wa anta ra'aytana. Wa bithalika tibin nafsan. Wa kum mutajamila. Wa in tasha'a kun mu'ajila. Wa in tasha'a kun mu'ta'ajila.